For DrydenWire.com, I'm Ben Dryden, and welcome back to The Brian Cole Story. I believe we're on episode 17 now. Brian, welcome back. Hey, good morning. How are you? I am. I'm awesome, except for the weather, but it looks good on Sunday. We're planning a ride and go bike on the bikes on Sunday. Oh, right. Well, this airs on Sunday, so at this point, yeah. you're going to be doing what? Out on the road. Out on the road. Yeah, Pastor G, Pastor G from Virginia, where I go down to every year yeah. um, to do re- revival services, I challenge him to come up here and... Uh, this he, he'll be rolling in on Saturday on Sunday uh, at the Oaks will be the first revival service during our church service and then Monday Tuesday and Wednesday um, he's going to be doing revival services starting at 6 30 at the Oaks and that what's is a, a revival thing. service that's uh for mainly for those believers just believers to get uh, reset man rejacked relit so we can go out there and light up our communities so anyone is welcome, and uh, Pastor G is going to take my big bike, and I'm going to take my little bike. Got a few other guys. We're going to go out riding after uh, service on Sunday. So, all right. And you said next week, though. So this coming up week. This coming Sunday, yeah. Yeah, but this coming up week, he's going to be doing stuff at the church. Yeah, starting this coming Sunday, and then it'll be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Sunday yeah. at 10 a.m., and then Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 6:30 p.m. at the Oaks. All right. And where do people go to find out about that? They can go on the Oaks website. They can get on my page. Um, Oaks website is what again? Uh, Oaksofdrummond.com. Oaks of Drummond, D-O-T-C-O-M. Sorry, that's a little President Biden joke there. Okay, so we left off last week. I wrote down, so I, I listened to the show again this morning to kind of get a recap. And you're a youth pastor. Then you became the pastor of the church, and that... Didn't go super smoothly, if I, if I recall. Yeah. Um, Marsha is pregnant for the second time. You just kind of threw that one in there at the very end of the last show. And I know that I did, uh, I was asking when prison ministry is coming up. And I don't know if that's where we're going to get to on this show. So that's what I recall leaving off on. Where do you want to start? Well, uh, so during this period, Dylan is born and... Uh, Never, never forget that uh, moment in my life. I mean, um, distinctly remember being there at the birth and, and watching and, you know, the doctor nurses and stuff are down there and Gross. I'm just kind of watching in awe. And as soon as he started coming out, I just started bawling. What? Um, yeah. Well, it, it was moving. It's like, here is a life form. Here is life that we created through God, fearfully and wonderfully made. Here comes this little baby and he's mine and you know i have a daughter and never got to know her know her never witnessed her birth and god's given me this opportunity all over again on this side of things so i was just in awe of god what god is doing with this birth and one of the nurses looked up at me and i don't know if she thought i was going to faint or something she goes you know if you don't feel like like you're uh you're, you're good and you might faint you can leave and i'm like you don't understand <laughs> and uh so yeah the birth was was very moving to me Mm-hmm. Um, so, so Dylan was born and, uh, so at this point where, uh, he's, he's a baby and I got this job, new job now, and I'm living in Chippewa. This is in Stanley. So there's this back road from where we were living just a quarter mile up the road that goes directly to Stanley. It's a back road. And, uh, so it was about, you know, 45 minute drive or whatever. I had my, my motorcycle license by this time and was taking the bike a lot. Well, then it was to the point where, okay, we, we need to move to Stanley. Um, so we ended up finding a place from one of my uh, Bikers for Christ brothers, uh, Sugar Bear. Uh, his daughter had a home next to the perfect, I'm a youth pastor, right next to the school. Perfect. And old farmhouse, two-story, all that. So, um, so we're moving. And uh, on our very last trip... It was myself, and I was on my little black rat rod, and my oh, wife was in the in the Chevy Blazer behind me. And then there's a dog behind. Yeah, whole week in here. <laughs> uh, in the Chevy Blazer behind me, like I said, last load. So the Blazers filled up. Let me stop this. Okay? No, that's fine. We'll, we'll just we'll just wait. I'm not even going to stop it. I just want I want to watch you take care of this. <laughs> I can edit this part out later, but we'll find okay. out. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. And... All right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I just want to see what is this backdrop. I need to know what those pictures are. Hey. Looks I'm like Brian's recording. taking up some art go. classes. Go lay down. Go lay down. Be nice. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> Who tells a dog to be nice? 
Be nice. Little turd. Well, I sent all the kids and everybody downstairs, so he, now he's out there alone, and he knows I'm in here. And <laughs> sure. Hey, what are those pictures behind you? Uh, drawings. Those two pictures. Oh, all, yeah. There's a bunch of them up there. That's oh. the uh, theology program my uh, Dylan is going through. Um, so each one also has a a verse on it with stuff that he can color and stuff during one of the nights of See, the I week thought they were she... yours. Like, no. Oh, you're taking up art. <laughs> I, I actually we did. Me and my son just started oil painting. What? So yeah, this is my son's first painting. Oh, that's a what how old is Dylan now? Ten. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's right. Uh <laughs> back at back at it. You're moving yeah. to Stanley. Moving to Stanley and You're on your rat uh, rod. We're on, yep, I'm on my little rat rod. My wife is behind me in the in the uh, blazer, packed full. Got a trailer behind it, packed full. Um, Lance is in there with her, my oldest son, who was, you know, probably, I don't know, 10 at the time, 12 at the time, and then baby Dylan. And we're cruising down this back road. She didn't feel comfortable going full speed with the truck and the trailer and stuff, so we're doing about 45. And we come up, and it's it's like July ish the corn no it's probably august or it's it's august or september because the corn is up probably head high now sure and we get up to this one corner and there's two you know stop sign on each side of the the, the road there and and this corn fields and this this is right where the the corn is almost right up to the road so unless you stop and pull out a little bit if you're on that side road you can't really see the traffic right so i'm cruising along and all of a sudden woof a car comes flying through that side road like 40 miles an hour, uh, probably three car lakes in front of me. And as I'm looking that way where it went, I notice movement to, to the right again, and I look, and here comes another one right at me. And he flies through the stop sign about 40 miles an hour, and, and I'm not exaggerating, probably six inches from my front tire. I seen it coming. I got up on my, on my uh, highway pegs, and I was ready to just be hit and fly. Um, and it, it missed me by like six inches mm. and I slammed on my brakes and pulled over. My wife pulled over behind me. I'm turning the bike around. She's rolling the window down. She's like, you don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna, and oh, I no. left. And now I'm doing, you know, burying the needle on my little rat rod, trying to catch up to this car and doing the same thing they just did basically. And being, just being stupid, going through stop signs and stuff. And I catch up to the first car, which was the last one that went through and almost killed me. And uh, they rolled the window down, and they're like, no, no, the guy passed us. That's the other one. And I felt like, well, you guys went through it too, you know. So I cruised, and and this guy, you know, led me probably five miles down the road, <laughs> a couple side roads, and then he finally uh, started pulling over. You know, and it, it's hot out. I got my, my tank top on with my vest. And uh, so I got my biker garb, and... And uh, he finally pulls over, and I just drop my bike on the other side of the road. He's on the one side of the road, and he rolls his window down, and you could see him shake. And he's like, "Man, I'm sorry. It's just a kid. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, and I'm sorry." Well, as soon as I started heading down the road after that happened, I'm praying. I'm like, "Lord, you know what I want to do right now, man. Give me the strength to deal with this because I, I don't want to do things this way, you know." And so I'm praying the whole way, even though I'm How bizarre. out of my mind with anger right now. So I'm like, listen, man, you, you you saw how close you got to me. You almost killed me. And what would have been worse is that, that vehicle that was behind me with the trailer, that was my wife with my new baby in there. It, it would have been bad enough if you hit me, but if you would have took them out and, and, and something would have happened to them, this would have been a whole different scenario. 13 or 10 years ago, this would have been a whole different scenario. You're lucky that I am a saved human being, man, that God has got me and the Holy Spirit got hold of me on the way here because I would have ripped you out this car and tore you up. And I, I pulled out, I had, uh, had uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, cards, uh, business cards made. As a, as a youth pastor during that time. And I threw one in his car and I said, I'm the new youth pastor here in town and I expect to see you, you know, Shut and I got up. on my bike and I left. <laughs> so that was the third big temptation when I got out that the, that the enemy threw at me that, man, I wanted to rip this dude apart. A, a uh, not so much of what he could have done to me, but what he could have done to my, my family had he hit the vehicle. Um, 
and I told him too. I says, you know, I understand what you what you did. I, I did stupid stuff when I was a kid too. Yeah. But hopefully, this scares you enough that this is your one lesson, and you won't need another one. Um, now, I want to fast forward. Probably three years later, I get a call from this lady uh, who knew about me. She's up in the the next town in Kadat. And she said that she had two kids, her older son, who was like 18. And this, by the way, this kid was probably 16 years old. The, this kid was 18 or 19 and their other son who was 14. And they were both using meth and stuff and want to know if I'd be willing to come and talk to him. And I'm like, most certainly. And this was right behind that. When you go off the Kadat exit, there's a big gas station there. Yeah, I, yep, place. Yep, I'm, yeah, so I'm right that. behind that building, there's another building. And that's where I met them at. Okay. So I, I met with them and it was just me and the, she left and me and the kids talked and we had a great conversation. And, um, you know, she asked if I'd be willing to talk to him again. Yeah, I will. A couple of weeks later, I go and talk again. But the younger kid ain't there yet. It's just me and the older kid. So we're just sitting there sh shooting the breeze. And I start talking about my motorcycle. And he starts talking about his and, and he says, yeah, I have a, a or have had a, a, a Yamaha Virago. And I'm like, really? This, but that's what I got. I got a little, well, it used to be a Yamaha Virago. It's all ratted out and blacked out and all this and that talking about my bike. And, and all of a sudden he's kind of looking at me funny and, and he says, have you ever almost gotten into an, an accident? And I said, yeah, lots of times there's a lot of stupid people around, right? He goes, no, I mean, did you almost get hit one time? And then it, it's like, yeah. And he goes, that was, that was me, me in the car. And I'm like, wow. So my point in this, we, we continue to have a great conversation. My point in this is the importance of our testimony. <laughs> we just have no idea, man, when we're going to meet up with people who may or may not know us. I remember one time having a really bad day up here just a couple years ago and um, I was in the process of painting and I needed to go to Walmart and get some paint. And, you know, since COVID, there ain't very, there ain't very many people <laughs> working anymore. And I'm sitting up there uh, waiting for the paint person to come. And it's like, man, 10, 15 minutes. I mean, it's different just waiting for a couple minutes for a burger in our little fast food society. But I'm, I'm up there 10 minutes waiting for somebody and, you know, there's no bell. And, and normally I would kind of snap off a yeah. little bit, you know. Um, so eventually, you know, I'm walking back and forth and a little bit later, a lady comes around a corner and comes in, she goes, can I help you? And I feel like saying, yeah, like 20 minutes ago, yeah, no you know? it, right. but I'm like, yeah, you yeah. know, I, I need some help. And I just started talking to her and I had calmed down a little bit by then. And as I'm talking to her and she's mixing the paint up here, it's a, a lady who knew me and had been following, um, my Facebook page. And started talking to me about my ministry. And I'm like, man, again, it's just we don't understand the importance of our testimony. That kid would have never, never listened to what I had to say had I handled that situation any different. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So our, our testimony is so important. No matter who we talk to, what we just, well, us as believers, what do we call? We're, we're called ambassadors for Jesus Christ and an ambassador represents Jesus Christ. And what would my ambassadorship look like if I would have, yeah. you know, took this dude out of his car or, or threatened him or whatever, man. And, um, we just don't know. So there was that. And, and the yeah, Lord, and so by the way, I, I want to, you said that was your third main temptation. One of those other ones was when it was your wife's, it was the dad, right? Your wife's dad. Her and dad. then you got a knife and then you were in a car. If I recall, you were kind of talked down, yeah. Right. Down I mean, by, you did. You, yeah. you did to your credit. You called a few people. I think yep. you called two, and they weren't there. And a third one that you finally got hold of, and they're the ones that said, "Here's the thing: you're not in my office. Fifteen minutes, I'm calling the cops, or something like yep. that." But yep. you really needed somebody else, to, And you did reach out again. All credit yep. to you did reach and out. I, that was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, this time you didn't. Yeah, yep. it was the third one. But just saying, that's progression. It is. And you yep. didn't need to call someone. And I just, it's funny, not funny, but still kind of funny that you're chasing after this dude in the in the rat rod when this all happened and you're yeah. praying and I'm you're praying. talking to God and God is with you while you're doing that. That is just, yeah. I think and there's a lot of people get, that can relate to this. Yeah. He needed to get to my, my emotions and stuff for that. He didn't quite say, well, first, first of all, you need yeah. to slow down and all that. No, no, no. You don't need yeah. to do this. Here's how you're going to handle this. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm just saying that's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. So that that happened and, and it all turned out good, man, and it was a great testimony. And 
Uh, so anyway, here I am at the, I, like I say, my official start date was May 28th, 2010, but that was like uh, August, September when we finally moved there. Um, so in the meantime, doing a lot of ministry, traveling all over the United States, uh, speaking at churches and youth groups and dance companies and, and Gideon conventions and uh, even got uh, asked to be part of an international Gideon convention down in Orlando, Florida one year. As a matter of fact, this year they asked me to come a second time and that's a pretty unique uh, honor to be asked to come back again awesome. to an international Gideon convention. So um, that's pretty cool. So now I'll talk about the, the, the prison ministry a little bit. So I, I did have, uh, didn't have <laughs> any kind of uh, inclination of going into a jail or a prison anymore. Um, I was all, all good with never, never having to go back again. Um, so one day, uh, I get a phone call from a pastor at the Chippewa prison. Now that's where I had been released from, yep. um, like probably at this time, three years prior. Uh, so I, and it wasn't the same chaplain from when I was there. So he, they obviously didn't know about me, but he's like, yeah, my wife said she heard you on the radio and thought you'd be a good guy to get in here to talk to the guys. Would you be willing? And I'm like, well, here's the thing. I was just paroled out of there, you know, a couple of years ago. And, uh, he's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll talk to the security director and program director and we'll see what we can do. And that was that. So I never thought I'd heard, hear from him. Right, I wouldn't if, either. If you're on probation or parole, you cannot go into a Wisconsin prison as a volunteer for anything. So I thought that was a done deal. So fast forward a couple, three weeks later, <laughs> he calls me back. Well, you, you know, the, the, the security director and program director are willing to talk to you. So if you want to come in. And uh, I'm like, okay. So I went in. I'm like, these guys are not going to approve me. <laughs> hold, hold on <laughs> a second. So you're going, is this the first time that you've been back into a, a prison or a jail setting since you were released that three years? I, prior? I believe so. If I did go in anything, it, maybe it was in a, in the, one of the jails in, in uh, Chipper Eau Claire, but I don't think so. Cause no, cause the Chippewa jail wasn't going to let me in at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't think I was. Okay. And what, so do you recall what kind of feelings you're having? And you know, granted you're going into a different capacity yeah. here, but uh, that had to kind of screw with your head a little. Yeah. Well, like I said, I, you know, I didn't really have that thought until after they approved me, but it was like, it, well, I'll tell you that when I, when I get to that, because okay. that, that was huge in my mind then. So I went to this, I had, I had no belief that they were going to allow me in yeah. <laughs> at all. It just, it wasn't going to happen. It's impossible. This is Wisconsin prison talking about their knuckleheads and they're not going to go, go for this at all. And so when we got done with the meeting, they're like, we're going to approve you. <laughs> what? We're going to approve you to come in. I'm like, okay. So that when I, on my way home, then that is when oh. I had a talk with God, <laughs> you know, so sometimes we do, we think we can, yeah. talk to god that way yeah somehow. and i'm but assuming it was like a hey do, i don't really want to do this i mean yep. find someone Everybody else i got what you're thinking i got enough to do <laughs> don't send me back there man i spent most of my yeah. life there so that was the thought it's like lord man i am all good with never hearing the clanking of keys and the squawking oh. walkie talkies and all that ever again 27 years in prison come on man don't do this to me why are we why are we going there and all i got again not vocally i, I, right. I don't God doesn't talk yeah, to me yeah, vocally. Yeah, right. You, we but hear I him, get... but not like actual words in our yep. brains. Right. Got it. So what came to me was, who knows you the best? Well, the guys in prison. And who knows how much you denied that I existed and hated my people and all that. And it's like them. <laughs> in prison. You are the best person to go back in there and show them that I'm not only real, but what I can do to people. And you're like, and, dang it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> You're killing me. So that right. began my uh, jail and prison ministry career. Um, I started going in there. I was I was given a uh, second Sunday of the month to go and preach to the guys every month. And it was awesome. And there were times when we baptized people and they gave me permission to even baptize people in there. And even though it was a, a program, so there's a lot of turnaround. Sometimes we'd have six guys. Sometimes we'd have 40 um, but it was, but it was cool because it was such a big turnaround when you complete the program, you leave that there was always someone who was going to be leaving when I was preaching in there. So, um, to be able to have these guys, you know, at the end of the message, just say, Hey, who's not going to be here next time. And all right, come up here and we're all group around them, lay hands on them and just pray for them. And, um, so it was a spectacular experience. Well, then 
when other prisons stepped up, um, uh, it wasn't prisons. I, I got involved with uh, Good News Jail and Prison Ministry out of Triple Falls in Eau Claire. I got involved with Prison Fellowship, became a Prison Fellowship volunteer, and they started uh, had some things going on in some of the prisons up here in Wisconsin. So I started going in, the, in there with them. Um, got invited to go down to a prison with my motorcycle with another guy and going into the prison with a motorcycle down in Kentucky. Um, uh, so it's, I, I've been in a lot of prisons and there's uh -uh. only one that ever denied me. And that was Stanley. <laughs> they will, well, they have their own thing going on, but here's the thing. You probably have your own file one, there, right? Yeah. Once one prison let me in, they all had to let me in. Sure. So, I mean, except Stanley, cause they're different and they're unique. And yeah. Did you get, uh, do you get paid to do this stuff? Do they pay? I, I don't know no. how this stuff works. No, no. Don't even like gas mile, anything? Nope, not even gas mileage, nope. So you're doing this because hmm, God says because I should be the here. Lord told me to. Because <laughs> God <laughs> said so. <laughs> yeah, we don't argue. <laughs> and no, once I once I went, you know, because a lot of and people in ministry will know what I'm talking about. We think that we are going to bless these people, whether it's uh, a prison or jail or youth or the youth group or whatever, like we talked about last week. You know, I thought I had more to to you know, give to the, the older kids and the younger, you think you're going in to bless us, these people, and, and you end up coming out more blessed than ever. Uh, these, these, these ministries, uh, whether it's out speaking or in the jails, prisons, whatever, uh, I come out of there probably more blessed and more moved and learn more things than me thinking I'm going to do when I go in there. So it was just as much for me, man. And, and they just, you know, these guys bless my heart. And there's so many, even now, um, I go in there now, we're 13 years out. There's still guys that I know. There's still guys in there that were my roommates. I mean, these people know me. And and when I, I, I get letters or uh, people come to the church once in a while, or I'll get a text like, dude, I remember you. And, you know, whether it was before or while I was coming in for a message, dude, I remember you. And, you know, so it's 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 going to be an ongoing thing because if some of these guys are, are doing life, doing 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and they'll be getting out all the way up until I die. And, and they just know know who I am and know what I'm about. But the best part is they knew who I was, you know, and what I was all about most of those years in prison. So they knew um, I was for real. I was a real deal and mm. and they respect that. So really cool. Um, so yeah, during this whole time, just kind of loving up on the youth. We, we had, uh, as far as the youth group, we had probably, you know, around 20, 30 kids come to the youth group and, and, uh, we dealt with mostly, I guess, the, the, the drudge, the, the really bad kids. There mm. was like kind of three groups in town. I was the only paid youth pastor. I tried to get us all to work together. That never happens, but I was the only paid youth pastor. And we had a humongo area that used to be the Christian Academy. By that time we had concerts up in there every month, every month for probably those last three and a half, four, three and a half years, we had one to four bands in there once a month. And I'm talking about most of them were all Christian metalcore bands. Um, but we had rap bands, all kinds of stuff going on, uh, different speakers coming in. Uh, it, it, so all these three different youth groups, they were, they were kind of, we were the bad kids. The bad kids came to ours. And then the Lutheran church, they had a goody two shoes. And then the, the, the vineyard church, they had just, the, I don't know, the, the weird ones or whatever. I don't know. Right. We're all weird, man. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so it, it, it was funny because we had a, a, a lock in one night and we invited the, the, all the other youth groups, sure. the other two youth groups to come. Some of the ones from the Lutheran church did. And one of the girls had a really rough life and, you know, into the stuff and bad parents and all that and living with her grandparents and, she ended up jumping ship and I felt really bad about that. But it's like, can I come to your youth group? And it's like, uh, why don't you go talk to your pastor about that? You yeah. know, and, and just because she felt more comfortable because she goes, all these girls there are fake and, you know, they, they don't really have the life like I do. And, and, you know, as far as your life and the kids that you deal with, I, I, I can associate with that and I can, Relate. I can, you know, come alongside that. Yeah. So, um, she ended up getting saved uh, a couple weeks after that and baptized and still today we're in touch. As a matter of fact, I married her and her uh, husband. Um, I've married oh, three. Married her. I'm like, what's going on now? Okay. Yeah, I see what you her. mean. No, you, I married them. Yeah. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so, so we had all kinds of stuff going, got to the point where there's a lot of, uh, really, uh, bad kids as far as into the stuff that, but they weren't comfortable in the church. So we decided to start a, a youth cell group at our house on Wednesday nights, our youth groups are on Sunday nights. Um, 
and in the even in this farmhouse man we had a pretty big living room but there was times where even in the in the winter we had to go outside because we had so many we had upwards of 45 50 kids sometimes in our house um and it, it was just off the hook so we had a couple of different things going on with the kids and they just ended up being my uh, our our kids yeah. our family and there was this group of older kids that when i first came in they were they're already like you know 18 out of school and all there was four of them and they're like dude you know i got with them because their parents are part of the church and all that and i'm like dude you know where were you two years ago i wish you were a youth pastor i'm like it's not too late man well these dudes love metalcore too so it's like Monday I invited them, hey, you guys want to go to a concert? And uh, so we went up to Chicago and went to this uh, four-band concert, all metalcore, you know, like War Ages and uh, For Today and August Burns Red. And and we're in the mosh pit together, you know, the the whole show. And, and so we ended up doing that with those kids for about three years, going probably two or three times a year we go to concerts together and just mosh out and have a great time. And uh, still in, in touch with those kids today. Um, took one of them to uh, Texas for a, a missions trip one time, and one of the other ones, Silas, uh, I, I had the honor of seeing him really come to the Lord uh, last year or commit his life to Christ because I don't think he was he knew he knew about the Lord. His dad's a pastor and all that, but totally he committed good. himself. He got he got married, asked me uh, to baptize him and his wife, and uh, he's just all lit up right now. So just some great things going on and. Uh, you know, we got our first our first dog together when we moved into that house because we could have a dog. So I got my third Doberman Pinscher. Uh, that was Batista and Batista, you know, and the kids and us just having a good time. And uh, so you're living in up, Stanley. Yep, in Stanley at so that farmhouse next to the school. Got it. So you're living down there. You're the pastor, youth pastor. Yep, youth pastor, associate pastor. Yep, um, second child. Your wife is pregnant. Where, where, how far along is she at this point? Uh, by the, you know, by the second year there, or no, end of the first year there, he, uh, Isaiah was born. Isaiah. Yep. Yep. Cause he was part of the, he was always running around there at the, at the youth cell groups at our house. Sure. So So. everything is looking at your life now. It's been how many years you've been out? Three, four years? Yep. Three, four years now. And do you, at any point, are you stopping and looking back or, find yourself reflecting on, wow, now I'm doing like prison ministry. I'm a youth pastor, involved in the church. Yeah. There's so many moving parts. Uh, we have two children. We have a place, everything. And go, that, this is crazy. That has never stopped. That has never stopped. It's every day I think that just about, I'm, I'm not lying. I, I tell people I ain't lying when I say that. I'm not exaggerating. Almost every day I go to the over to the church and unlock that door and walk in. It's like really, Lord. <laughs> it's like, I'm still amazed at what where He's got me in life. But um, yeah, so it, you know, during during the time at that church, uh, Pastor Mike is is still teaching me, and and we're, we started theology classes in the church. Uh, started uh, uh, church history classes, uh, cult classes. Um, so he's got me leading classes now once in a while too, asking me for advice. And that tripped me out the first time he said that my, you know, wasn't even there a couple months. He's like, what do you think, Brian? I'm like, you're, you're asking me, I'm still trying to figure out how to do all this, right. you know? <laughs> and then one day he came to me and said, why don't you get ordained through the, uh, E-Free church? And I'm like, I don't, I don't need it. And he goes, I know you don't need it, but I know you can do it. And I'm challenging you. And I'm like, all right, you, uh, you're going to go there. <laughs> so I did. And I uh, went through the uh, licensing process for the Evangelical Free Church, uh, Forest Lake Districts, and that was probably the most scariest thing in my life. I uh, it's a it's a big process. People think, you know, people when they think ordinations, they think get on the computer, get that free stuff. You got your certificate, you can marry people now. Yeah, no good. This is the, this is the real deal. This was no joke. Um, the E Free Church, most churches have what they call a statement of faith, and ours was uh, E Free has one that's ten points long. Uh, so what the ordination and licensing process is, is you have to defend that statement of faith. Um, and it starts out with a, you know, they give you, put somebody alongside you to mentor you through the process. You have to write a 25 page paper defending all those points. Once that paid paper is accepted, uh, you set up a date with the E-Free Church uh, and you go in front of a, a bunch of theologians and they, for an hour and a half for the licensing process, question you on those on those points so that day i went in there there was like eight of them in there i was so 
nervous. I almost puked before I went. I've never been nervous like that in my life. And uh, so I went in there and I sat down. Well, I knew a couple of the guys. One was my mentor who mentored me through the paper. And uh, right away they were joking around and it just made me feel really comfortable. And, and it ended up being a really great time. Um, you know, it, it, it was still a heck of a process, uh, kind of nervous through it, uh, because there's things like, uh, most of the people in the E-Free, cause it, it doesn't matter where you stand on some of these issues, just so you understand where you stand on them biblically. Sure. So like with the E-Free, most of these E-Free pastors are what they call pre-trib guys. They believe in pre-tribulation. I happen to be pro-trib, uh, or post-trib again, doesn't matter where you stand pre-trib post-trib, mid-trib, no-trib, doesn't matter. But they didn't care that I was post-trib, but they wanted me to be able to defend that and and defend why I wasn't pre-trib. You know, why why do you think it's not pre-trib and all that? So there was all that going on. And at one point during the process, I you know, you could bring notes and stuff and they bring your Bible. And at one point, you know, I have this the, the, the set free tattoo on my, on my yeah. back of my forearms here mm-hmm. with the Bible verse. And one time I forgot the Bible verse and I looked at my tattoo and I'm like, yeah, uh, <laughs> so and said that out and at the end of it, you yeah, know, that's, like, that's oh, nice. we'll let you know about how you, you know, how you did and stuff, but you did good. And, uh, I said, well, I know one thing you guys will never forget me. Cause I guarantee you, I'm the first, probably the first and only person that has ever used a verse off a tattoo yeah. on their arm. You <laughs> know what cheap, I'm saying? Tattooed on his arm. So right. a couple of weeks later, got the letter and the certificate in the mail saying I passed my licensing process. Nice. And, um, so that was just, I've never one time, I don't even know where that thing is. I've never put it up on my wall because it didn't mean anything to me other than a challenge from Pastor Mike. Um, and since then, now we're the church we have here, we're through Converge. And I uh, thought it'd be cool to be dual ordained. So I went through the ordination process and uh, through Converge, which is kind of similar, but instead of the theologians, um, all the area pastors that are Converge and some other ones who are friends of mine came and they questioned me. Yeah. Um, so I got that and I called E free and I'm like, Hey, I got my ordination through uh conversion. It's weird because conversion E free are have about the exact same statement of faith. They have staff that, that sure. go back and forth between each other. And they're like, yeah, well, we don't believe in dual ordination. So we're going to have to drop you. And it's like, what? All right. So that's just all they are, man. So right now I'm, I'm I have my ordination through converge great lakes and, um, again, what a mess. Didn't need it. yeah, what a mess. So. So yeah, there's that. That's uh, pretty much. Uh, you know, we we ended up moving into another another house because a lady was going to sell that house, and we moved into a old farmhouse. Uh, guy was a great guy, and and just I don't know, the, the rent was cheaper, and just an old farmhouse, but it was great and a little bit smaller for the kids when they came, but. Sure. Um, but we were piled in there, and uh, just and, and all of time. this was so. It's about three years after you were out. Yeah. And that was, so how many years ago was it from now? That's what, 10 years ago this was? That I got that job? No, like from where we are right now in the story uh, compared to today. How many years ago was that? Like 10? Well, I I was released June 1st, 2010. I got the job officially on May 28th, 2012. And I got my job here, I think in uh 2017 i've been here six years so So i was there four and a half years but where we are in the story down in stanley that was around 2012 2013 yep yeah so that was about nine ten years years ago all right i'm just trying to put this all into context here so i understand like where we are because before it was how many years you've been out of prison and it's about three years but now we're starting to get closer to the where you are today yeah that'll probably happen next week yep all right. Well, on that note, what is uh, what are we looking forward to for next week? Well, uh, I think next week we'll just finish off here in Stanley and and what really brought this this position about here. Because even up to this point, I had no desire <laughs> to be a pastor of a church. The youth, I could have died. I could have died doing what I was doing with those kids. I, 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 there's no yeah. reason I would have wanted to go anywhere. I would have, I was comfortable and that's not a good thing to be in, in your Christian life. I was comfortable in that. And I, I, I love those kids. They were part of our family that we didn't just do groups with them. We did life with them. And, uh, so it was actually an event, um, that I went on, uh, up in this area that precluded this whole thing coming about. So we'll get to the end of that. I'll bring that story up. 
um, the event that I did up here and how that led to um, this position up here. And a change, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a big move. change. I mean, not just a yeah. change. And a pastor, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, you become a pastor and then you move from there and then everything, yeah. Holy cow. That's yeah. awesome. It is. I love it. I wrote uh, just a few things when I'm writing down just for some reason, the stuff that you say that just kind of sticks with me at the very beginning. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've underlined this throughout the show. When you said importance of our testimony, mm. that was, uh, that was a takeaway for me. Yeah. I don't know about anything else, but that, uh, yeah, that's, that's powerful. It's, that it's so huge. I don't think, <laughs> I just don't think many of us understand it. And, and you know, I, there was a few times in my, uh, early speaking career, uh, I guess you could call it, that I had other people come with me or I had individuals who I thought I knew that were supposedly in the faith come and speak to my youth at the youth group and then later on found out that they were involved in some stuff they shouldn't be involved in. And it's like if my kids would have found out about that, you know, what would have, what would that mean to them? I mean, even the wrong way that we as Christians look at things, like if a, a, a pastor or a, some – uh, important Christian author who's writing a book has a falling or something. Um, we just automatically have the thing that, oh, we're just going to disregard everything that they ever taught and every book that they ever had and, and diss him. And it's, it's not the way it works, you know, but even more so with just our daily lives. Uh, I, so I don't bring speakers with me anymore unless I absolutely know them. And they, they've had a testimony for a few years. Sure. Um, because everybody and their mama, especially when you go to prison, every, almost all these Christian guys you talk about, they want to be pastors. They want to go out and speak and do what I do. And it's like, man, that's a calling from the Lord. I had no inclination, number one, of ever going out to speak. That was never in my mind. I had no inclination whatsoever of being a pastor, youth pastor, any of that. I, I just wanted to, to live my life and, and have a good job and take care of my family. And those things came up. Uh, they came up. I didn't strive for them. I didn't ask for them. They weren't even in my mind. Jeremiah 33, 3 makes coming to Christ very easy. Call unto me and I will answer you. But the second half of that is a great promise, an extraordinary promise. And it says, and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know. And that's exactly what he's been doing in my life. A youth pastor? A pastor? Speaking at conventions? Speaking at youth groups? Me? You know what I'm saying? We have no idea what he's got in store for, but so many of us like to plan our own life out and not listen yeah. to what God's will is for your life, and then you're doing it wrong. You're not. You're not going to succeed at it. You're going to. Yeah, and I think there's a, a, the the verse right after Jeremiah 33 was whether you like it or not, or maybe yeah. that was in like the like the application part at the bottom, right? <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, the, 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 it's important, and you know, again, we're ambassadors. Amen. And what what does your ambassadorship look like? We represent Jesus Christ, man. And there's just so much garbage out there that that these professing Christians are are doing, and that's what one of the many, 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 many things that gives Christianity a bad name. You know, these these people that are out there doing that, they're they're either not in Christ. You know, they're they're fault they're false professions, yeah. or they're babes in the faith, and they got yeah. a lot of growing to do. And not saying we're all perfect, because obviously I'm not. No, and I, I get fail it, and I do things. But man, as long as you're repentant, you know, and 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 if it, if you do that in front of somebody, you know, if I snap off on a, a grocer or something, man, you need to be repentant about it. Whether it's that day or the day after or the week later, you go back in there and you say, you know what. Man, I was so wrong in, in how I treated you. You did not deserve that. Will you forgive me? You know, and that's how you need to deal with things as a Christian. I think it was. They will never forget that. You and when mom was uh, 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 filling in for me, when I listened, I think it was on that show that you, you guys were talking about like the people that wear crosses, or maybe that wasn't. Mm -hmm. I thought it was that that just kind of drives you nuts, right? It does. With yeah. the necklace and the cross, and you're like, dude, you're no, you you don't, <laughs> you should not. There should be a law, right? Especially you can't wear that, stuff, man. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, brother. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll. Uh, I look forward to next week, uh, episode Indeed. eighteen, and we'll start to going into. Yeah, this next how you uh, transition to, this seems like it's going to be the start, the starting point of your transition to where you are now. Yep. Because when this next move happened, this is your last move. I mean, yeah. in terms of uh, where you are in yeah. life now. And hopefully my last move yeah. ever. <laughs> Sweet baby Jesus, right? <laughs> Boom, my last move. <laughs> Please. All right, man. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, we'll see you next week.
All right, love you, girl. I love you too. Bye bye.